podcast. So as Sylvia said, this is the title of the paper that I'm working on together with Viksha and with Elisa that didn't come to the event, unfortunately, because they're really nice people. <laughs> um, so I think it's a, a great um, order that you all put because it dialogues a lot with the previous paper that you all presented. So I'm going to show you my research question, our research question, and why we think that that's relevant, then just go uh, through a very fast literature review, and then the data that we are coming up with and how we intend to model, and then some very preliminary results on it. So the context that we are dialoguing with, uh, so we are focusing in Latin America, basically because there are a lot of things in the region in the macroeconomic sense. The dialogue's a little bit with your question in terms of how, uh, what are the, the things that put Latin America as a region in terms of macro movements. And basically there's a lot of literature that talks about First of all, the popularity of inflation targeting strategies in emerging economies and in Latin America specifically, and we have a list of eight countries here that do have specifically by the central bank inflation targeting, and the other ones that are in my sample, they're not here. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, also worry about inflation targeting. It became a very important thing for emerging economies, um, which by theory creates a tendency of the real effective exchange rate to appreciate, right? Because you are decreasing internal prices. Um, and the countries in Latin America in general are also marked by very liberalized trade regimes, flow of capital in and out very easily. And a lot of them had the, um, the commodity price boom of the 2000s actually made a lot of structural changes or at least medium run changes in what these countries were exporting and what actually gave them money to conduce policy in general. So in general, the literature talks about Latin America having a change in GDP composition with all of these effects going on, in general, decrease in the size of industry. And uh, of course, that this generates labor market impacts. And then I'm going to argue that it does not only reduce employment generation, but also the quality of employment, which is what we'll be focusing. So the question that we're trying to answer is what are the gendered impacts of those changes that we see in a lot of the macro literature associated with Latin America? Um, and the variables that we're going to be very um, pay a lot of attention to are female and male employment ratio and the job quality. And this is the main contribution that I think that we are getting. And I'm gonna tell you why, <laughs> how we measure this in a minute specifically because it's sector specific. But the idea here, and it's a very simplistic way of measuring it, I understand, but also um, claiming that jobs that pay more than the national medium is okay to claim that those jobs are just better especially when you're talking about Latin America that um, have a lot of structural, um, like universal healthcare and a lot of those benefits that come with jobs uh, in the US and make a huge difference in their daily lives. In Latin America, it operates a little bit different. So when we talk about job quality here, we are basically talking about how is your weekly earnings compared to the medium weekly earning of a specific sector. So, we see that there's an increasing importance of gendered impacts of macro policy, especially in the post-pandemic world. I think that the presentation before me did a great job of explaining why we have this increasing inflation, increasing interest rates, a tightening fiscal space in a lot of developing countries. And one of the things that unfortunately marks um, gender literature is that most of the explanations for gender impacts are very focused on supply side. So why women don't get more jobs? Because they have caring responsibilities because of a lot of mechanisms, uh, because they choose to get educated in careers that are not that profitable for them where you cannot get a very good job. And a lot of the literature only focuses on the supply side explanations. So what we are trying to do is trying to see this macro perspective and also bringing some demand side impacts from the economy as a whole and the job market specifically. Um, so, a very brief literature review. So we dialogue a lot with the premature deindustrialization uh, literature about the Latin American region. Uh, there is a lot of 
debate about manufacturing employment shares or manufacturing output shares as being the variable that we should be looking at when you talk about the, the industrialization. But a lot of papers claim that we can just choose one because they go together very well. And a lot of the models um, in the literature show that premature deindustrialization is precisely marked by the peak of the manufacturing employment shares and the peak of manufacturing output shares happened a lot smaller and a lot earlier when compared with countries that developed first. Um, so we're gonna be using manufacturing employment shares in our literature, in our data. Um, Gabriel Palma also has this um, non-creative destruction concept for Latin America in which he talks about the way that the region um, had a tendency to destroy its industrial sector, industrial sector, but not in a way of creating more modern things, right? So it was just basically uh, moving to a mostly service economy without actually having that peak of industrialization. And I think that this term is very good. So I know I that literature too. And uh, there is this piece from uh, Stephanie Seguino and Elisa Brown thing from 2019 that analyzes industrial sector jobs precisely already approaching just job quality thing that I'll, will be the main focus of this paper. And uh, according to their data, industrial sector jobs tend to be of higher quality. Here they use different measurements. They talk about productivity and other things, but in general, industrial sector jobs have more benefits and higher wages for workers. So uh, when we talk about labor market segregation, which is a, a lot of, what you're trying to measure, right? Segregation by gender, which is our focus here. Uh, we use, use this idea of dual labor markets that come from stratification economics. That it's basically this idea that you have labor markets that are divided in good positions that are mainly occupied by um, people who have power. And you have the other part of labor, of labor market that is occupied by people who don't have power. In specific gender literature, we are talking about men occupying some parts of some jobs, specifically higher paying, higher power, and women not occupying those. And there's a lot of, um, how can I put this in a polite way? <laughs> there's a lot of protecting your turf kind of thing, segregating certain groups to achieve certain positions of power. So we use those concepts of dual labor markets from uh, certification economics to talk about gender specifically. Uh, we also are very aware of care responsibility and gender stereotypes uh, associated with women. And in Latin America, uh, the numbers of unpaid care and care responsibilities. And if you take the uh, world value survey uh, about what people actually think in Latin America, those stereotypes are very present. Um, and one of the characteristics associated with a lot of care responsibilities is precisely informalization uh, for people who are responsible for unpaid care work. Um, a lot of the literature that we talk about also talks about bargain power in the job market. So possibility of actually trying to bargain for higher wages, there's a lot of um, papers that try to analyze how women, because of a lot of different constraints, are less likely to, first of all, start bargaining, and second of all, be successful, especially when um, their boss with who they are bargaining with is not a woman. And um, there's this paper from 2016 that it's gonna be very relevant for this specific debate on job quality, that talks about the defem defeminization of manufacturing employment. So basically what they show in this paper is that when manufacturing starts being a highly technological sector and you don't have a lot of like everyday workers, like what it, we in Brazil we call chão de fábrica, so uh, workers with lower levels of formal education and that work really in the everyday jobs, when you start having more managerial machine controlling, more specialized jobs in the manufacturing sector, um, those are heavily occupied by women, uh, by men, I'm sorry, compared to countries that are industrializing later, especially in Asia, the majority of that are women that work in the, with very low um, wages, very low job quality, but as soon as the manufacturing sector starts developing to higher technological levels, we see a decrease in women participation. So it's a U-shaped relationship. 
that they find in this paper. Um, then finally, why we think that we have to analyze Latin America as a region and what are the things that, what are the things that we believe that um, are kind of a trend for the countries that we have in our sample. First of all, the region is marked by higher educational attainment for women, which is the number one argument um, of a lot of the folks who are a little bit progressive, but not that much, is that if you just give education and you focus on STEM programs, then all of that's gonna be beautiful. Women are gonna get the best jobs and you're gonna decrease the gender pay gap. Well, <laughs> we already have higher educational levels for women uh, in a lot of countries in Latin America, and we don't see the gap closing or at least not closing as fast as it could. Uh, we have high rates of informality in the entire region. We just talked about that in the previous presentation. And especially for women, the rates of informality are very, very high. Uh, we have higher unemployment rate for women, which is also not true for a lot of East Asian countries, for example. And we have high integration with the global economy. So those countries are especially vulnerable to shocks in the real exchange rate or other trading capital flow shocks. Okay, so what are my left-hand side variables, my dependent variables, what I'm trying to see? We built a data set with the weekly income of employee or self-employed people across 27 non-agricultural sectors in industry and services. So not agriculture, just those two sectors divided in 27 different categories. We use the UN industrial sector guide to make all of the 15 countries that we use to fit the same sector. A lot of countries already adapted to that. So starting in 2016, it was a lot easier, but we put all of the sectors to all of the years in this 27 non-agricultural ones. And within each sector, there are nine occupational categories. So these are basically clerical work, machine operator, just like what is your specific occupation within that sector. And then based on that, we define what a good job is, which is basically jobs in which the median weekly income in that occupation, in that specific sector, is above the median income for all workers in that sector. Make sense? So we just have uh, the employment is just gonna be the sum of people in sector J position K of gender I, and it's only gonna sum if it's greater than the median, right? If it's not, it's gonna be zero. Okay. Yeah. So the two, I mean, three left-hand side variables that we're gonna see is women or men's share of good jobs within a specific sector. So employment share of a good job for gender I, it's just gonna be this, the share of good jobs over the total ones. And then we also look at women's relative share of good jobs. So for every man with a good job, how many women have a good job? Those are the three variables that we are looking at. Men and women share of good jobs and women's relative share of good jobs. And then with, that insane amount of data. Uh, by the way, if you are curious about how we got the data, we went to country specific micro data to build this macro data set. So if you, at the end, I have the sources of each one of them, but for example, in Brazil, we use the PNAD uh, and for other countries, similar household level representative research at the micro level to build a macro data set. So this is the industry value added as a percentage of GDP for the 15, 15 countries in Latin America that they were looking at. Um, then we have this green line here is the percentage of women employed in good jobs. We only have that series starting here in 1996, but we can see that it's a very low, around 30%, kind of not changing trend percentage. And then we have the percentage of men employed in good jobs, which is that purple line up there. And then we have the women, men share of good jobs, which is gonna be here, always around 50%. So for every woman, um, for every woman with a good job, there are two men with a good job, kind of. Make sense? Mm -hmm. for them. Um, and here we have just dividing the two big sectors that we are talking about, 
the share of good job in services and the share of good jobs in industry. So as we can see in services, it's been declining and in industry, it's a little noisier, but it's been increasing. So the first slide that I showed about this, um, the industrialization process due to a lot of different phenomena that impacted Latin American region, the fact that these jobs are becoming more rare and these jobs are the ones that are growing, make tend us to um, believe that this is a problem in terms of good job supply, right? Uh, and here I just have by services and industry by gender as well. So up there, we have the, shot, the share of men's good job in services. And uh, this is an important characteristic. That's why we use another subsectors because in services, the quality of jobs is the variation is very, very big because people that do um, very low paid services, like, I don't know, in the beauty industry or stuff like that, compared to people who do insurance policies and financial services, the variation is huge. While in uh, industry, the variation of course is big, but not that much. So the highest share of good jobs is for men in services up there. Then we have men's in industry. Then we have women's in women in service. And then finally, share of women's good jobs in industry. So for Latin America, the theory that <laughs> after you moved to your, after the peak of manufacturing, the more you move out of it, the more the jobs become masculine, which is kind of the opposite of what we see um, in Asia. So, um, okay, so for the right-hand side variables or how the macroeconomic environment is gonna impact those job qualities variables that I'm talking about. The variable of interest, what we are trying to look at is precisely if the real effective exchange rate uh, can account for some of what we see, can account for that change in industry and the quality of jobs available in those industries. So just a reminder, we are all economists. I know we all know this, but nominal exchange rate is the amount of domestic currency needed to buy one unit of foreign currency industry um, times the ratio of the price level of the trading partner of the country. So uh, a higher real effective exchange rate means a depreciation in the domestic currency. Therefore, for every time I put expected coefficient here is the share of women's good jobs, which is the main variable. So we expect the relationship to be positive, right? We expect that depreciation in, um, in currency, it's gonna increase um, the share of good jobs. Uh, and here are just all of the other variables that we use as our macroeconomic kind of demand side thing. And we put two supply side controls here because they're also important for uh, women's a proportion of good jobs. So we have women's educations over man education in terms of years completed. We have women's uh, labor force participation rate and men's labor force participation rate. And then we have all of these other uh, macroeconomic variables that make sense that they would influence the quality of good jobs available. So we are mainly focusing here on real effective exchange rates, but we do have to control for all of these other things. And before you stop me, I know that putting per capita GDP growth in the right-hand side is a problem. Therefore, our modeling strategy is to try to control for the indigeneity of GDP per capita by using a two-stage least square uh, instrumental variable approach. So, we build this unbalanced panel data because again, a lot of the data that we use is micro collected at the household level by countries. So a lot of them have problems in the cities. So we use, um, the panel is unbalanced, but we did t-shirt type tests. They say it's okay, so it's okay. Uh, we have 28 years, we have 15 countries. Here's the list of countries that are in there. Um, again, we're gonna do a two-stage least square instrumental variable model. Uh, the per capita growth is instrumented by its lagged value and the current and lagged value of investment as a share of GDP. Uh, I know that in general, this is done with a lot more variables, but since growth is not our most important variable here, we're just instrumentalizing this way so it doesn't generate a lot of noise in our regression. And um, the preliminary results are this. This is the second output, right? 
so I think that there's a lot of interesting things here. First of all, we have real effective exchange rates there only being statistically relevant for the employment share of women in good jobs. Um, but one of the, um, and it is with the expected coefficient, right? Uh, and one of the things that uh, I think it's really interesting to analyze is that when we look at the impacts of women's good jobs and men good, jo good jobs, this, the coefficients are in a lot of cases inverted. So that this leads us to think that there's maybe a competition for top positions, for good jobs, even within each industry. And that is true also for your effective exchange rate. And therefore, I think that that relationship of one going to one side and the other going to the other side messed up our results on the uh, women's men's ratio of good, good jobs. So I think that there's a lot of things here to are show us that the coefficients make sense. For example, women's and men's education is always highly positive, positive impact for women, negative impact for men. So from this preliminary results, we believe that it makes sense. <laughs> Our general idea makes sense, but that there's more to explore uh, in terms of why there's such a big competition, even within the same sector of this availability of good jobs, which is, um, something that we're trying to focus on, maybe come up with left-hand side variables and composition of uh, sectors to see how it plays out. Yeah, that's what I got. <laughs>